So I finished watching Star Wars Visions Volume 2, so it's time to take a look back and reflect on all that, well, that was shown to us. So we're going to be talking about each individual episode. Time stamps will be in the comment section down below. Um, so let's just jump on right on in with Sif and then we'll move on to all the other ones. Okay, I'm a little bit getting to this, but I'm finally watching and reviewing Star Wars Visions Volume 2. So I might as well begin with, well, the first of the volume, that being Sif. So this was directed by um, Rodrigo Blas and also written by him and animated by El Grilly. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But what's the episode or the installment about? It's not really an episode per se, but the main thing about Star Wars Visions is looking at other ways of exploring the Star Wars universe. And this, um, Wikipedia says that it's said during the High Republic, I have no reason to doubt that, but Wikipedia says that as well, because what you think Wikipedia probably got it from. But anyhow, so the, the main character is Lola, and then the other character, besides the droid, who's E2, we also have, um, have Sith Master, simply as that. So apparently Lola was a former Sith apprentice, but has now re renounced that way of life, and the Sith Master is going after her, trying to um, get her to fall back to the dark side, I guess. But all Lola wants to do is make a painting, and she's struggling with it. And it's not until the end, after she's defeated her master and realizes that the darkness is a part of her, is a part of the painting, that she's able to complete her painting and she leaves the plant wherever she's at. Um, so that's kind of the brief plot summary. And I would have, and I have to say, I think the choice of animation style was beautiful. And I think in comes it. Lola wants to make a painting. So it's animated, the world's animated in very much a painting aesthetic. Um, um, the exact painting aesthetic, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's not watercolor. There's different schools of painting, um, different techniques and all that. But what we really did like how they did here, um, I, is by having, you know, the the um, plot reflect the the animation style. You know, Laura wants to paint, so the world, so the style of the world is presented almost like a painting. Only the characters. Do you sense that they're not the painting, but the world around them is? You can say in some ways that Laura sees the force as art, as a painting. See how this is all connected? I'm probably doing a very poor job of explaining it, but I really did like what they did and how they accomplished it. Very well done, in my opinion. This is, I'm not sure what else this animation studio has done, but I guess a very good job of connecting the story and the animation style together. Lola wants to paint, the animation is very much paint-like. And the way the animation presents itself with either colors or lack thereof is very reflective of her current mental state. And she learns that the darkness is a powerful. Doesn't mean she has, has to let it control her, I hope. Um, but it's still a part of her and she just can't suppress and hide it away. It's always still going to be there. And that, I think, is the central message of Sif. Um, but those are just my thoughts. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Screechers, which is the second episode of Star Wars Visions Volume 2. And so far, I've noticed the theme. Now, probably won't continue beyond these two, but you never know, is that the main antagonist being the Sif, being the dark side in some form, which makes sense as a very common theme in all of Star Wars. But Screechers Reach is basically a bunch of kids working in a workhouse. No. It, that's literally the setup for the episode. And our main character, Dao, wants to get away from it all. And she has this animal that she's been speaking to the entire time, you know, asking him for strength and all that. And then there's this ghost story about Screechers Reach, you know, nobody ever blah blah blah. Stand ghost story. Um, I know, I don't know why I said blah blah blah, I thought that would be funny, but I don't think it was. But you never know, it might have been to you. But anyhow, so, she confronts about her friends, leaves the cave of Screech's Reach, and in the end, it's just a little, an old lady, not a little lady, who's, cons but an old lady consumed by the dark side of the force, and Dao takes her out, and carries the lightsaber out. And then, the character in the credits identifies Sif Mother comes and takes Dao away, kind of like she was hoping for, but not like, you know, like how the Jedi would, if you will. Um, now, the Jedi probably would, you know, be more comforting, you know. 
as how to say, but in many ways, Dao's setup is not to descend from Luke's race or any other character. They're stuck in a crappy life. Even in well, Luke's case, it wasn't that crappy. He had his family and all that, but they all longed for more in some form. Luke longed for adventure. Ray longed for family. Anakin longed to be free. And in, in, in Dao's case, she longed for something besides her. You know, she, in a sense, except for her friends, she had she longed for something more. And in some ways, in that longing for something more, she lost sight of what was important, her friends, who, you know, they're sad. You can tell they're sad to see her leave. And it's very much portrayed in such a way that, that um, the, the character of Mother is like, is shown like, looks beautiful, like, can't be any wrong, but the credits tell us that this character is up to no good. She lets Dao keep the lightsaber, which is a red lightsaber. Was it Jedi do that? That's how I first picked up that something's off here. There's a few, there were a few other things picking up something is off as well, but that is the moment that cemented. Yeah, this character ain't no Jedi. And the credits confirm the, Je the character was a Sith. And so, once again, we have two episodes in a row that our character is confronted with the Sith, confronted with the dark side, but they make different choices. In the previous episode, Sith, Lola comes to understand that the darkness is a part of her, and, and, and but at the same time, she doesn't need to let it control her. She, gain, she gains the mastery over herself and over the Force and able to completely delete her painting because the dark is a part of it. She's not trying to suppress it and more rather not let it control, if you will. Um, meanwhile, in here, Dao, in some ways, you can tell she's now started on the dark path because she was looking for the quick and easy way out. And that's actually, when you look at Luke and Ray, just as a comparison, also longing for something more than they have, they didn't take the quick and e easy way. So Luke, despite all his longing to get off of Tatooine, he still doesn't go until he's forced to go. Um, he wants to help his family, um, his aunt and uncle. Like, sure, he may whine and complain and want to, you know, see the rest of the galaxy, but he also understands that his family needs his assistance. Same thing with Rey, to a certain extent. She longs for family, and she thinks by staying on Jakku is how she's going to find it. But being forced off Jakku because of Finn is what allowed her to find a new family that she could be proud of. And, and that would accept her as well. And with Anakin, how do we put this in? He also had some of those same drives, long to be free, long to get off of Tatooine, but he never could quite... In some ways, both Luke and Rey, they were forced off due to circumstances in such a way that they had no reason to return back. Um, Rey's story was learning that she didn't need to return to Jakku to find her family, while Luke, he had to leave Tatooine because of the plot and the plot gave him no reason to return until Han Solo was encased in carbonite and put in J on display in Jabba's palace. But Anakin, he had a reason to return. And the Jedi did nothing to help him. So who knows how it's going to all end up. But those, our three main protagonists, we can all see elements in Dao. In some ways, Dao is a bit more similar to Anakin. No, she has friends, not family, but she still has friends she's close to. And she has a community. She has people to hang out with, people she likes. But yet, she just wants to, she's longing for something more. And in some ways, takes a quick and easy path for that. And with Anakin, no, what he's longing for was still behind. And he tried to take the quick and easy path every single time to try to hold on to what he was afraid of losing. I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but I might be. I tend to do that. So I'll transist to that in general. But a few other things before I close out the video. Screechers Reach is directed by Paul Young and it's written by Will Kynes and Jason. I'm never going to try to pronounce his last name. I'm just going to put it up on the screen for you. Yeah, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. And then it's animated by Cartoon Salon. Salon. I'm not sure which way they are pronouncing it. English is a weird language, by the way. But I just kind of want to give credit to who made it, because like Visions, it's all about getting other people's visions, interpretation of the Star Wars saga. 
And that's what we see right here. We see very similar elements from all our main characters, but blended and done in such a way that creates a haunting story. A story that you could in some ways see like being the beginning of a whole story. In many ways, it was a whole story. Um, the light shows the truth many times in the episode, but it, but you also have the character Seth Mother who's using the light to deceive as well. And I think that's a good hallmark of the dark side. They use the light to deceive. You know, trying to twist it to their own will, if you will. Um, but that's going to be my last concluding thoughts. I would love to hear your thoughts and screeches. Reach down in the comment section down below. In the Stars is the third installment of Star Wars Visions Volume 2, written and directed by Gabriel Osorio and animated by Punk Robot. <laughs> So to begin with, the most important thing I think to note is is um, Gabriel Osorio, he is Chilean and in the studio he worked with is also Chilean and they take those themes especially from colonization and apply it to this short. It, the animation music is beautiful but they, those only are in service of the story they are telling. Countless times in Star Wars we've seen the Empire come in and uh, exploit the planets for resources and exterminate, but oftentimes we're seeing that stuff. Mainly, we see that from the perspective of the Rebel Alliance. So we see, you know, our heroes, whether you know, Cal, Luke, anyone else, come in and see the Empire exploiting. But often enough, we don't get to see it from the people who are being exploited, whose plan is being destroyed by the Empire. The closest, in many ways, was Star Wars Rebels with Ezra and Lasal. Um, we got to see the Empire real exploitation of LaSalle from Ezra's perspective. But even then, he was kind of, the story did pull him out of LaSalle. In the Stars, it's a story about two sisters, the last of their kind, and basically the Empire has taken over the planet, exterminated, committed genocide against their entire culture, and, and has polluted their planet, taken all the clean water, everything. And the connection to the, the culture has been lost. The younger sister still has more of that. You know, the child instance where the older sister has become basically more focused on survival than anything else. And both of them kind of, most especially the older sister, has lost sight of the culture. The younger one has lost sight, but not in the same way. It's more of she lost sight because her sister lost sight and she's not fully able to connect. And only through the course of the story, once, once the older sister re you know, realizes, once again, awakens her own nascent force abilities that she probably has been suppressing and trying to survive, that both, both sisters are able to f fully reconnect with the culture. The younger sister always had it, but you could tell it was being held back because the older sister was holding back. And showing that bond, the familiar and family bond that helps preserve many cultures. Like I mentioned earlier, the director and writer, he's Chilean, and Chile, like so many other countries, was founded by basically as a colony of another empire. In this case, Chile came from the Spanish empire, and the Spanish exterminated many of the native inhabitants or forced them to assimilate into their own culture. The story of colonization in the real world is a story of imperialism and the extermination of other cultures. Many cultures have done it, and many cultures have been the victim of it. To list them all would be, well, probably would be good just to dedicate like a whole video series to it because there's so many. But this show, of the three I've watched so far, might be my favorite. I don't think I can fully articulate why, but I think it has something to do with the story that they chose to tell, how being a simple personal story, and how by these two sisters sticking together and realizing, and especially the older sister, realizing what was important that they were able to save each other, but also to end the empire's occupation as a planet. Well, hopefully. Things don't always end with a happy ending, but this episode did end with a happy ending. The pollution cleared, well, I can see quickly, by the way, but where was the force? And they were once able to see, once again, able to see the stars. And the stars is where they believe all their ancestors go after they pass away. 
and the most important one to all of this is the mother who led, who was a full sensitive member of the, the society, who led a rebellion against the empire, but ultimately failed because of the empire's things. And actually, I think the reason why the two sisters succeeded is because the empire was overconfident after defeating the mother. I'm just going to say, I think some overconfidence played a role, like, really? These people, we can take them easily. While that was not shown, that's probably the attitude the Empire had. And because, you know, the Empire, you know, took the easy option to defeat them. You know, didn't, you know, try to, you know, outmaneuver them or anything like use tactics. Just throw you know, Imperial troops and equipment at it and hope for the best. Well, guess what? The Force was on the side of the two sisters. And they succeeded. They destroyed the Imperial base slash factory. And the worlds began to heal. I think that is just such a good ending. And should I even mention how beautiful the animation was? So I first thought I thought this was stop motion animation, but it turns out they made clay sculptures and then they scanned them in. And so it's essentially they animated the scans, the 3D scans of the sculptures they made. So, so in some ways it's computerized stop motion animation, which is kind of interesting, but I really did like it. And the music was so... I mean, it was just beautiful. Again, it's taking some inspiration from local indigenous cultures in Chile and Patagonia, which Chile does control part of Patagonia. I'm not going to get into a full geography lesson there, but those are just my thoughts on the episode. There's more I could discuss, I could really discuss, you know, the history of, of indigenous cultures in the Americas, but I'm not qualified to discuss that, so I think I will end this video here, but... My final screening thoughts is this was a beautiful show with great music, great acting, great animation. But those are just my thoughts while yours. Let me know in the comment section down below. So I just finished watching the fourth short, fourth episode installment, whatever to me what you use, of Star Wars Visions Volume 2. That episode being I Am Your Mother. So this episode was directed by um, Madalena Osin... Oh. I ho hope I pronounced that correctly. It'll be on the screen so that way we can make sure. And she also did the story with the telepay being by Holly Walsh and Barunka Oshangnese. I am totally badly butchering those names. But the animators, well, anyone who's watched Wallace and Gromit should be familiar with. I've never watched it, but at least I'm, I know of Odd Man animation. So. It's odd men who did the animation, so at least I'm familiar with them. Don't really watch too much of the works, but I am familiar with it. And the animation style that they is very much their style. Claim um, stop motion claymation, I believe, is what it is. But regardless, this is um, the first short of the other ones I've watched that I can say without a doubt is a comedy. Um, it's not too much, but. It's, it's a, the story is a very good story, but there's one problem with it. I feel like I saw how it was going to go too well. In other words, I knew exactly what the story was going to be, and I just couldn't enjoy it after that. I still actually did enjoy the episode, but what I guess maybe not enjoy, I couldn't invest myself in the story because I knew how it was going to turn out. You know, you have mother and daughter, and the daughter is embarrassed by the mother, doesn't want her partaking in a school activity that's for families, and because uh, she's afraid she's going to get embarrassed. I gotta say, I've watched so much cartoons, Disney and otherwise, I've also watched lots of older TV shows, especially, you know, stuff from the, the 60s and 70s, and this was a common storyline. I believe Saved by the Bell might have done this once or twice too. To the point where whenever I see this type of story, I just tune out because I'm used to the story. That doesn't mean they didn't do a good job telling it. I mean, this is probably one of the best tellings of it that I've seen. But that's also probably because I tune out. And I probably kept better tuned in because it's a Star Wars story. Um, this is kind of a weird take on it, I guess. But if the story is maybe a little more unique or not so predictable. I think I might enjoy it a bit better. But I gotta say, I did love how the antagonist of the episode didn't get to win the race. They didn't even get to cross the finish line, so they couldn't even get second. 
So I I think that was very funny. That was probably the highlight of the episode. That, you know, like what maybe a minute or two after, one of the antagonists literally said that second is still last or something like that. Something to that effect. That if you don't win, you lose. That they don't even get you across the finish line. I mean that was peak comedy gold and the best part of it. Followed by, basically um the our main character Annie and her mother. I don't know, a little bit of reconciliation, but not too much. But, you know, there was a mo- point in the episode where she just sets out of all that she's embarrassed by. Which, you know, in some ways was good because now the, her and her mother are on the same page on that. But at the very end, which is perfect, that her mother, Kanina, tells her that embarrassing her is what moms do. Which I got to say, I did appreciate that. Um, But I did kind of... I didn't care for the fact that I could predict the story and that does kind of drop this episode down for me because technically story wise both animation and the story music all that was amazing it was all executed extremely well but the problem is the story does not excite me that much it was elements in here a scene here a scene there that I really enjoyed like how the droid was designed to look and act like a dog like it literally looked like it's an astromech like, oh no it's now moving like a dog would it's like that's cool but it was those individual elements I enjoyed, those, 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 the, each joke I enjoyed, but put it all together and it just, I think overall felt flat to me because, like I said, this is a story I have seen several times so I can predict exactly where it goes. So, that's not a knock on them who, a knock on the creators who did a phenomenal job. Same thing with the actors, they all did a good job. This is technically very good, but personally, this, this is a story I've seen one too many times. But those are just my thoughts on it, what are yours? Um, oh, I even forgot, um, Dennis Dawson returns to voice Wedge and Tilly's in here. I mean, that was amazing as well, um, but again, it's like those indivi- it's just one other individual element I liked. It's just put it all together and I just wish the story was a bit more memorable, a little more distinct. I wish maybe that they had done some kind of twist on the story that you normally don't get to see. But that's truly gonna be where I'm going to end my thoughts. You can let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. So I just finished watching the fifth installment of Star Wars Visions Volume 2, that being Journey to the Dark Head. So this is directed by Hyung Gun Park and written by Chung Se Ring and animated by Studio Mio. I hope I pronounced all those names correctly. I am not the best at Korean names, especially those that are not notable historical names. You know, so those names are just a little easier for me because I hear them a bit more frequently. But overall, I did thoroughly enjoy this short. This of the five I've seen so far is the most anime inspired of the shorts, which does make sense. Japan and Korea are neighbors after all, and there is some cultural similarities. It's just like how there's cultural similarities between the US and Canada, or even US and Mexico to a certain extent. There's just certain cultural overlap you get from being neighbors. France and Germany, despite being on the surface very different, do have some similarities just by nature being neighbors. And should we even mention colonialism and how that impacts culture and all that? Yeah, it does impact it, but we're not going to jump into that because that's a whole can of worms that this video is not the place to unpack. But so this very much has some similar themes to the very first short, um, Sif, in regards of the main character struggling with the darkness within him. Um, but it is told differently than it is told in Sif. W- one way that it does express it is um, is Sif was very much our character needed to accept that the darkness, so light and dark, were both a part of her. Well, in this one, he had to. So, um, what was his name? Uh, just wanted to make sure I get it correctly. Uh, Tal, Tol, something like that. Um, he needed to accept that darkness was a part of him, but he needed to. Ex- acknowledge his fear so he could overcome it rather than how instead it was much more ambiguous was the accepting that was a part of her so she could you know deal with it or control it it's hard to say but in here it's very much he needed to acknowledge his own fears his own darkness otherwise it would have 
consumed him. And by acknowledging it, he's able to deal with it, to control it. Um, so that is very much the difference between them. Even though the themes are largely the same, it's just how they are played out is different. Um, and then, of course, we have both our main characters. They have baggage. I already mentioned Taro having to deal and overcome with his fear. But our but the first character we introduced, our she's a um a young monk, and uh, there's a statue on her home plane that she that um she believes if she destroys so specifically the dark head, not the light head, but destroy the dark head, that it would turn the tide in the war between the Jedi and the Sith in favor of the Jedi. I would say she eventually becomes a mechanic and requests the permission of the Jedi Council to go and destroy the dark head. Ends up being they can't because the darkness and the light are once again shown to be intertwined. But that's also um, very much the idea is is both facets are a part of life, but it's the hope that comes with it, if you will. Um, very much the message of the episode is at a hopeful end. Oh, yes, darkness will always be there, always a part of you, but. You can have hope with the next wave, with the next day that you'll overcome it, or in the sense that you'll be a, or you, or more likely, a better way of putting it, is you won't let it control you. That's at least the message I took away from Journey to the Dark Head. But what are your thoughts? What did you think of it? Let me know in the comment section down below. So I just finished watching the sixth episode of Star Wars Visions Volume 2, that being The Spy Dancer. So this episode is written and directed by Julian Cheng, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and it's animated by Studio La Cache. Cache? Cache? Something like that. It's a French studio, so I'm probably pronouncing it slightly wrong, because, yeah, I know a few French sounds, but language is weird. But moving on from that. So you can definitely actually see the French influence in this episode. One thing, the very first thing when I heard the episode is tied to the Spy Dancer, guess what I thought of? Mata Hari. World War one French spy who was accused of spying for the Germans, all that. That's the first thing I thought of. But actually, this episode takes more inspiration from during the French the occupation of France during World War Two, where French entertainers were you not know, perform in front of the German soldiers, but also try to get intelligence or whatever out of them to give to the French resistance. That's more the inspiration they took in this episode. And the main character Louis really is who is she's the main dancer of the club that they're at. And she's, doing her dancing, she's actually putting trackers on all the Imperials and even some of their equipment to since she track with the ghosts. And that way the resistance on that planet has an opportunity to, you know, track them and actually be able to successfully resist and fight against the Empire. Of course, things go awry when she spots a familiar Imperial officer. At first she thinks it's the officer that took her son, we find that out a little later, but we saw the flashback so we knew it was a traumatic experience for her, but it turns out it wasn't that officer. We find out later, later on in the episode that it was actually her son who was taken by that Imperial officer and raised to be an Imperial. So kind of tough thing right there for her to deal with, um, but she does let him go, but she does still leave a track tracker on a piece that she, on a, actually a piece of her costume that she, she gives to him that's actually a hologram of him as a infant. You can tell he's starting to be conflicted now. So they're setting up some interesting stuff here, but it really ends on kind of a little bit of a hopeful note, if you will. Um, the, nearly everyone escapes the, the club after she tries to kill the officer who she thought was the one who stole her son. And so the, so even though Essentially, the cover, cover was blown. Things are not all lost because now they have instilled doubt into a member of the Empire. That could be very beneficial for them or not, but it ends on that hopeful note. And there's also another character, I forget her name, but she's she's not the main dancer, but and she's basically her cover is as the sweet little waitress. But she wants to do more to fight the Empire. Well, she does get the opportunity in this episode. And she and one of the resistance members, John, successfully take out a KX security droid, which is pretty impressive. Um, but they, they really did a good job in this episode of conveying the environment of, you know, a plan under occupation where you have to pretend that you're getting along so that way you can actually be able to successfully fight them a bit later on. Like, sure, we saw in Star Wars 
rebels and also Star Wars resistance, people fighting against the Empire, against the First Order, but not really too much in terms of subterfuge. Even in Star Wars and Over, there's a lot more cloak and dagger, except for Mon Masma and, um, uh, what's his name, Lucen. There's not too many people feigning affection for the Empire and Empire to, you know, to help the, um, the resistance by ga or the rebels by gathering tenders. That's, well, I'm actually kind of surprised that that's not addressed enough in the Empire. Sure, we get people complaining about the Empire, like, okay, in public we have to be this way, but you don't get too much in Star Wars of seeing people fighting the Empire by feigning loyalty. Really, Andrew is really the best example of that, and even then, Ando is our main character. Mon Mas is just a major supporting character. Um, or it's, or co-lead in some regards, but still not the titular character of the show. Despite the answer, it's the titular character and every, and you know, everyone working with her who are doing it. Who are basically being spies in the, probably the classic, there's two types of spies, you know. The person who's sneaking from the rooftops using binoculars or whatever and observing what's going on. And then there's a spy who embeds himself in the enemy to gather intelligence. Surprisingly, we don't we mention that a lot in Star Trek, but we don't get many protagonists who are doing that, uh, that we are following who are doing that. We don't get that a lot, but we do like how they did that in this episode. Also, can we just say that this is another story about um, motherhood, just like I am your mother. It's just another story about that, but this one I like a bit better, probably because I didn't see where the story was going. So it was easier for me to, you know, be like surprised and excited by the next development in the plot line. But very much there's also some inspiration from, you know, how Luke was tempted by his father being on the dark side. Well, he was Louis basically tempting her own son back to the light side. I mean, that's just those parallels though with other Star Wars elements is just so great. This really was an amazing short and I really did enjoy it. But I want to hear your thoughts on it. Let me know in the comment section down below. There is so much more we can talk about and that's what the comment section is for. So I finished watching the 7th installment of Star Wars Visions Volume 2. The 7th installment being the Bandits of Golak. So this episode, this installment is written and directed by Ishan Shukara. It's an Indian name and I do apologize for butchering it. But the animator, the ADA Pictures, is much easier to save for me who does not have a good grasp of Indian names. Um, but hopefully I did put the name on the screen so that you guys can at least see what I was saying there. But I'm um, going to begin with, this definitely of the ones I've watched so far, definitely felt the most so far connected to the regular Star Wars universe. Probably did help that the animation style was pretty much inspired by how Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars The Bad Batch have been animated. I mean, sure, there are some differences in in coloration, but like the techniques almost appear to be not that dissimilar. Um, so this literally felt that it could have been like one of the one-off episodes of, of The Clone Wars or even a episode of The Bad Batch in terms of animation. And so that probably did contribute it as well. But also by having set a lot of the stuff as, you know, like literally the line at the very end is uh, may the force be with you. Like, like sure we get that in other sets, but uh, in other installments, but this one's the one it felt the most like it's given in other Star Wars properties. Probably that's because that's the direction the creator wanted to take. From what I do understand, that is what the director wanted to do. So, should probably talk a little bit about the story itself. This story is set during the Galactic Civil War. I mean, you got a force sensitive girl, um, her name is um, Rani, and then her brother Chauk, I hope I'm pronouncing both of those correctly, are basically hiding from the Empire, kind of. More of the trying to get some place safe. And it's implied that their father some they they don't have the father anymore and it's kind of implied that the empire is responsible but it's not spelled out and that's actually probably the biggest thing with a lot of the elements of the episode a lot of stuff are strongly implied but not as much of it is told to us now that can be a very much a fine thing to do especially in this case because 
the context skills are very strong. Is this was in one of the other episodes installments where things were a bit more disconnected? Then sure, but since this was a lot more connected to the regular Star Wars universe, I think we can piece those pieces together. The bandits who attacked the train that they were traveling on are rebels fighting the Empire. The you know uh, the that the Empire is responsible for the father's death. Like we can make those assumptions safely because of how connected this one feels. And at the end of the episode, an Inquisitor confronts them, and they're saved because the place they, they decided to take refuge, well, the person who owned it, controlled it, um, supervised it, whatever, turned out to be a Jedi survivor, and she defeats the Inquisitor. And from what some things I've learned, that the designs of the Inquisitor was taken from, I believe, Hindu mythology, um, especially with how sometimes demons are portrayed in the art, I think. Again, I'm not the most familiar with um, Indian culture, so it's hard to say, but like, you know, I definitely could see the stuff me and... I, I think that's what I'm trying to say here, the stuff I'm familiar with as an American, I did pick up on the stuff, like things like there were certain characters like I felt like were more inspired by how Sikhs dressed than regular Indians. Things like that for background characters too, but also some characters are clearly Indian inspired, some not so, some more, um, more the in- India's uh, ethnic minorities like Sikhs. Like all that stuff I do pick up on. Um, but again, I don't know how much of that you know, was intentional, but I do feel like they wanted to create a picture of India in the Star Wars universe being that this is by Indian creator and anima- animation studio, so it does very much make sense to me. Um, but going back, at the very end of the episode, the Order 66 survivor takes, takes, sorry, the Order 66 survivor takes Ronnie to a refuge with other Force sensitives, and Chera gives Rani a, um, a lollipop that's in the, sh- that's in the shape of a traditional, um, Indian suite. Um, I had to look it up. I'm never going to try to pronounce it. And then they've had this entire time with them, their father's flute, and Ronnie gives leaves that with Charak to remember her by as well. So I really do like that there. So they have a way of kind of remembering each other. So things are not totally, you no, know, ending on a sad note. But it is a sad note, but it's also a hopeful note because Charak leaves playing the flute right after he tells his sister. May the force be with her. The first time the force was actually spoken, meaning he knew what the powers that she had. Oh, another thing too, one of the um, character models on the train, yeah, he looked very familiar from a, from Star Wars The Clone Wars, like the, the Jedi who was always walking with a cane and had like a pale white blade. I forget his name, but Ahsoka had a whole arc, arc, um, story arc with him that, I forget the, the exact arc, but come on, like, they, did. The, they choose that on purpose to make us think that was going to be the Jedi that was going to save the day. Because I think they did. But you know what? I really much did enjoy this episode. Well, I have talked about other ones being my favorite. Like, I really, really enjoyed the Spy Dancer and really all of them to an extent. Even I'm Your Mother, where I mentioned I thought the plot was too predictable. All of them have been good. But this one, I felt the most comfortable watching. And I think that's because they took told a story in the Star Wars universe, but simply with an Indian twist. Like, all the other ones, you can tell, they're Star Wars, but they're like, you feel like the stories that will be told in Star Wars, not necessarily a story from Star Wars. Does that make sense? And this felt like a story from Star Wars. And I think that greatly changes how I'm viewing the story and even how I'm talking about it. But those are just my thoughts on this. I would love to hear yours in the comment section down below. So I finished watching Star Wars Visions Volume 2 Episode 8, Installment 8, The Pit. So The Pit is directed by Lee Andrew Thomas and Justin Ridge while being written by Lee Andrew Thomas. And is animated by the art Shatagio. I hope I pronounced that correctly. It'll be on screen for you so you can at least see where it's supposed to be. And Lucasfilm as well. So this is actually the first one where Lucasfilm is cited as an animator. In fact, Lucas, this is the only one that Lucasfilm was directly involved with. And as I understand it, Lee Andrew Thomas, he is a part of Lucasfilm, so that does make some sense. I hope I do have that right. But regardless, this story is definitely very much 
connected with the experience of African Americans, of Black Americans, you know, being forced to labor for somebody else and not being able to enjoy the fruits of the labor. That is clearly a influence on this story. The Empire is using a bunch of Imperial slaves, you know, prisoner slaves, and they're digging a big pit to mine kyber crystals. And then a city is built nearby. The residents have no idea what's going on. They've been made ignorant of it through Imperial propaganda most likely, but realize that often through Sometimes it's propaganda being misled by people, and sometimes it's just you don't want to face the reality that your luxury is oftentimes on the back of somebody else's backbreaking label. So you can definitely tell the influences there. And of course, the, the story ends on a helpful note. Crux, um, he climbs out of the pit to look for help, and he does successfully get the attention of the people, and they're like, and they're like, Though they start question like everything they know because they are now hearing a different story. Somebody's speaking the truth, and but the um, the storm stormtroopers stun him and throw him back in the pit and it tosses him to his death. But his daughter uh, inspires everyone to chant "Follow the Light," and uh, which oh, echoes to the the city and the people of the city overpower the stormtroopers and rescue the people. And of course, and when they're leaving. Um, Livy, Crux's daughter, has a kyber crystal that Crux gave to her, one that they did not give over to the Empire. It responds to her touch and it turns blue. It's implying strongly that she is force sensitive. So, where this is going to lead us is hard to say, but the, the message of the story, the message of the pit is basically, you know, when those people who have been you know, forced to labor, who do not enjoy the fruits of the labor, they deserve to have the fruits of the labor. They'll, they deserve recognition of, of what has occurred to them. That is what this story is saying. It's saying that forcing people to work without enjoying the fruits of the labor, without being compensated for the labor, is not just unfair and unjust, but morally Wrong. That is what this episode is saying. It's a very important message for all of us to take away, especially in developed worlds like uh, developed countries like America and what's traditionally considered the first world. We have lots of luxuries, but a lot of those luxuries are because of either backbreaking labor or people in the past who were never fairly compensated for their labor, oftentimes against forced to do that labor against their will with no compensation. But even today. How many of our electronic devices are made in sweatshops over in India or China? And there's so many other cases, um, even with the technology itself. Maybe that one critical piece of mineral that makes it all work was mined in a, in a mine in a country where the workers are you know, barely fed or don't have running water in their own homes. Like, there is a lot of injustices in the world where people, ha- has, um, people have everything. They have luxuries uh, really unimaginable even a century ago. Yet, the people who do the work that allow them to have those luxuries are not fairly compensated for their labor. And many times, they're just forgotten about, discarded if you will, just like the people of the pit. And hopefully the message of this story will resonate with all of us here in the States and abroad as well any place, anywhere, even anywhere where there's a group of people who are living in luxury uh, comparatively and people who are not fairly compensated for their labor, whether it's against, whether it's forced labor or not, just unfairly compensated. Hopefully we take heart and realize that we can do better. We should do better. And that's a great message. Here, Star Wars often does it through the, through the symbolism with the Empire and all that. But th- I'm just going to bring in Star Trek. Star Trek shows a world where, especially the best Star Trek, where, well, a lot of those issues have been solved. Where people, you know, are recognized for the label. Now, some ep- ep- some storms of Star Trek do like to go more into the dystopian side of things, you know. Know, shed some light on the problematic elements of the, of the Federation and Starfleet over their faults. But the best ones show that they have their faults, but they want to do better. 
and we should also want to do better. But those are just my thoughts on the pit. This is actually probably, in my opinion, the most thought-provoking one so far, and probably the most important one semantically for us living in the United States. There's also, as I understand, this idea for the story emerged during COVID as well, so there is a little bit of influence there. But I'm picking up more on the historical influences of the story, where the, the long-term history in that just recent history where we're still grasping with what occurred and what will be occurring. But those themes, we even present in COVID, there were people, you know, we, during COVID, there was a lot of praise for essential workers, but essential workers, except for that praise, never got a lot of the compensation that they probably should have gotten. Um, but like I said earlier, these are just my thoughts. Like I said, this is a very thought-provoking episode. And like this, and uh, I hope we get more of the, these kinds of stories in Star Wars in the future. But that's all I have to say today. So I hope to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. So I just finished watching the ninth and last installment to Star Wars Visions vo Volume 2, Aru's Song. So this was written and directed by Nadia Dorries and Daniel Clark and animated by Tiger Fish. I think it's Animation Studios, if I get the name correct. Yeah, Animation Studios. So the, the episode is about a young good owl who has a special ability to connect with kyber crystals, namely that she can sing and they react to them. And her father is a miner mining kyber crystals for the Jedi. Specific on their planet, this actually, they had very similar mentality, sort of open, not quite a crawl, but same mentality, get us caught up what's going on. The Sith had at one point corrupted the, all the crystals on the planet and so the natives, the locals on the planet were slowly mining the crystals and giving them over to the Jedi to be purified but it had to be done one at a time. But Aru's ability in the Force allows her to sing and connect with all the crystals and at the very end of the episode, just by singing, she's able to purify every single crystal on the planet. And she leaves with, the Jedi, with a, one of the Jedi to go train. Um, I forget the Jedi's name, but that's actually something we've seen several times. Um, a you know, a young Force sensitive being taken away to for training in the Force in some form. Because each time it was different. Screechers Reach saw the dark side version of it, while um the the Bandits of Golok saw a Metal coming, but still hopeful. While this one is probably the most hopeful, because it's like. No, she's told it's your decision. She's able to choose to go, able to say, say goodbye to her father. Like, this is naive. This is not even presented the same way like Anakin is. It's presented as probably the, the most healthy and also the ideal way of new Jedi joining the ranks of the Jedi Order. Probably ways that over time, as they became more fearful for the dark side, they sought younger, younger, um, infants for training rather than making sure they're willing to go. That could be, th that's one thing I picked up on, um, probably unintentionally, but I do like how um, it does connect with that, with, you know, you can take those those three stories and with this one and show how it's probably showing the most healthy way of having young children begin training in the Force as a Jedi, you know, something that it's good to see. And of course, I should also stay in canon, it's always with consent of the parents among the Jedi. They don't take the children against the parents' will. I should clarify that, because some people online seem to conveniently ignore the fact that the Jedi do want the parents' consent, and won't take the child without the parents' said consent. But I have a feeling, probably, it would be better if they could also get the child's consent as well. Really, Anakin and now are like the only two examples in Star Wars storytelling where we actually do see that, that I can recall. There could be something in the comics I missed, but interesting, one case turned out bad, and I think this is going to be a good case, because it's also on a healthier way. You know, Aru knows her father is going to be alright. You know, things like that too really does help a lot. But yeah, this was just a beautiful story, really. I've talked a lot about the plot and the implications and how it affects upon Star Wars canon, but it really is just beautiful. It's, it is um, computer generated, but the made it look like, um, it was, it's puppets being animated, for puppets being animated, it's, it is just so beautiful. It's hard to say which one is the most beautiful, um, animation, but 
But that's something I'm going to be discussing in my overarching review. But this this was just gorgeous animation with just gorgeous storytelling. It really was just a beautiful story to end Star Wars Vision of Volume 2 on. But those are just my thoughts on this. I would love to hear all your thoughts in the comment section down below. So now that we've taken a look at all 9 installments episodes of Star Wars Visions Volume 2, let's actually take a look at, well, the season as a whole and what did I think. I overall very much enjoyed the season. I think I probably enjoyed it more than Volume 1, though that might be partially because there was a lot more variation in storytelling techniques and styles. Because Volume 1 was all inspired by Japanese and anime and done by Japanese anime studios. So it does make some sense. While each one was in Volume 1 unique and different, you could still see the underlying cultural influences being Japanese. And as such, there was, it's kind of like if you watch just you know, an entire season of just American Star Wars stories. It's the same thing. It's like that cultural context is running through the bottom. And what I really liked about Volume 2 is by approaching many different studios, not just the Japanese ones. In fact, I don't think there was as the closest might have been a Korean studio. But regardless, by approaching multiple studios and directors, writers in multiple countries, it created a, well, maybe not... I think the way I'm looking for is, while well, I was not, there was just much more cultural differences influencing the story, and a lot more variation in its takes on Star Wars. Like, I felt like a lot more of these stories could have taken some place in the canon Star Wars timeline, while in Volume 1, I did not get that sense. I got more of a sense that things were just set up much more differently, and apart from Star Wars, the Reg regular canon timeline stuff for like maybe one or two but here in volume two yeah i can see this stuff a lot more um many of them i can see being done like at ancient times in star wars or during the empire like there's a lot more in my opinion connectivity to the star wars universe as we know it the canon timeline visions is not explicitly canon but hey, hey if one of these stories get mentioned in the canon timeline i'm not going to complain but yeah, like seriously, a lot of these can definitely be taken that way. But we've talked about how they feel in relationship to Star Wars, how all of these do feel like Star Wars just in unique different ways, and how by having those different studios that they were able to feel uniquely Star Wars in uniquely different ways. That Volume 1, well yes, did do to a certain extent, but did not do to the same extent that they were able to do by having so many more opinions, so many more perspectives. Let's actually talk about the animation. All of it was beautiful, pretty good. There was only, I think again, I'm Your Mother was my least favorite animation. And I think that's just because I've never been a big fan of Odd Man's animation style. It's, like, I don't mind claymation, but their claymation is not my preferred style of claymation. Does that make sense? I, it's, it's weird. It's just a real personal preference. And, but when in terms of animation, there was a lot of it that was just beautiful. Like... Okay, Aru's song is the most recent in my mind, so of course I think it's the most beautiful, but it was very beautiful animation. Um, so many others just had gorgeous animation. The Spy Dancer was gorgeous too. Sure, it was a little more watercolory, but that was okay. It flowed in, in such a beautiful way, using kind of almost that watercolor influence. Don't know if that was the case, but yeah. Um, like, all of them had the had beautiful animation in their own form. Just some of them I liked more than others. Um, it's hard to honestly say which one was my favorite in terms of animation. Um, I would say Oh Song, The Bandits of Garlock, and Spy Dance are probably my three favorite animation. Um, the Spy Dance, I just love that almost that more watercolor, more painting, if you will, aesthetic. I'm not the best at art style, so I apologize if I'm messing anything up. And there was just something about how our song was animated that was just beautiful in its simplicity, but also colorful and complexity, if you will. I kind of hard to say. And of course, um, the bandits of Golak was just I felt straight out of the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch in terms of animation style. But really, all of it was beautiful. And the only issue I had with animation was one, one installment where it was just my personal preference. I could still tell it was it was well done. It was 
strong. It was it was competent, it, it, excellent. If you into that, but it wasn't my preferred type. A personal opinion, not harking on any of the technical issues, because there was no technical issues there. But it was just my personal opinion that I'm just not a big fan of Art Man animation, and that's fine, because that's my personal opinion. If that's your favorite animation style of these bunch, that's all right as well, because it's your personal opinion. And my personal opinion does not need to dictate your personal opinion. But let's also talk about the story. Obviously, um, I Am Your Mother by Aardman was, again, my least favorite story. But that was almost because it was, I was, it was too predictable for me. I was just too much able to predict the way the story was going. So it was dragging down on me. Um, again, I would say probably in terms of stories... I would say probably the last four are probably my favorite stories of Aru Song. The Pit, The Bands of Gorlock, and The Spy Dancer might be my favorite stories. But even Journey to the Dark Head and The Stars, Screechers, Reach, and Sifu are amazing stories as well. Um, but definitely those last four um, are probably my personal favorite stories. And of them that I have to pick, I kind of think it has to be either The Spy Dancer or The Bands of Gorlock. Um, I'll probably rewatch the season in, a, in about a month or so, and hopefully I'll do a tier list where I can actually properly rank them in order of my favorite to least favorite. But I need some more time to sit with them before I can firmly make that determination. I can only tell you which ones I like, which ones I didn't like, and which ones are probably near the top of my list. The, the, it was still too recent to make a firm conclusion for me. And that's actually a good thing about media, when, if you will. You have to sometimes sit with it to truly appreciate the art being told, the story that the creators wanted to convey to you. Like some of these, I watched over nearly nine weeks ago by now. And hard to say, you know, is my opinion when I record my initial review the same day as now. I think for the large part, yes, but there's some... Um, you know, new perspectives I've gained since I'm um, just thinking on it that have influenced my interpretation of the story, what I think the story is trying to tell, all that stuff. Um, I do feel like what I've put out in this review on my previous views are still fairly consistent, but who knows how I will feel in a month, in a year, in 10 years. It's hard to say. Um, there have been things I used to love. I go back and like, huh, okay. And then I just move on and forget about it. You no, know, some things just don't stick and other times things like you didn't like it when 10 years ago but you come back to it and like man this hits so much more differently now and it's possible that some of these shorts may do that for me some of them may not um we just gotta wait and see on that i do feel like i've been a lot more um, retrospective in this review that i wasn't necessarily for each individual episodes and that's probably because i'm applying more of a post watch thought process to it i'm thinking more about what was being told, how I'm interacting with the media. Um, I guess it's just my way of looking at it this time. And I hope I keep this mentality going forward when I finish reviewing other seasons of other shows as well. Um, but yeah, I think overall, I think in my conclusion section now, that Volume 2 was an amazing addition to Star Wars Visions. I hope we get a Volume 3 because there are so many more Animate, animation studios, writers, directors, cultures that deserve a chance to tell their Star Wars story. A story in Star Wars that is reflective of their culture that is still distinctly Star Wars but their own interpretation on Star Wars. And maybe that's actually why I've been so reflective. Visions has always about getting a, for that better term, a non-American, a non, <laughs> non-standard white American look at Star Wars by exploring those different cultures, those different perspectives. American, not American, white, not white, doesn't matter, male, female, doesn't really matter. It's just that different perspectives than we're used to seeing from Star Wars creators. And I really do appreciate it. And I do hope some of these, especially among my favorites, the, the writers, the directors, and maybe the animation, animation studios, and definitely them as well, we just not exclude them. Always someday get a chance to tell more Star Wars stories that maybe actually do contribute definitively to the canon of Star Wars. I think many of these creators will make a great addition to the ret- repertoire of writers, directors, actors even, all that stuff, anyone in the creative process for Star Wars. And I 
Hope some of them do get the chance again in the future. But these are just my thoughts on all of this. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. Let's keep the conversation going about Star Wars Visions Volume 2 and even the creative process as a whole because there is a lot that we can discuss. But thank you for watching my review and as always, may the force be with you. Thank you for watching this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like, upvote, and share the video. Also consider subscribing and following the channel if you haven't done so yet and to ring that bell on YouTube to get notified of when new videos release. The link tree in the description links to all my social media. Check it out if you are interested and once again, thank you for watching and as always, have a good day, a good night, wherever you are. May the force be with you, always.